Hello, I'm um, recording through my earbuds, so I don't know how the sound is, but that's what we're doing. Uh, this is Adrian, I use masculine pronouns. This is another vlog style freakish oven video podcast, typically from my craft room, but we're not in my craft room right now. We're on a walk. Yeah, so the clips you've been seeing in my craft room are of what uh, many sewists are doing right now, which is sewing face masks. Uh, for places that are accepting donated face max masks. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mama Gergs, my mom, is a nurse, and uh, one of the places she works um, had emailed out a general call for um, face masks, the Olsen-type mask, which is the one with the curved seam down the front. And that was the first I'd heard of anywhere local accepting those masks so um i'm starting out on those uh but i've also gotten in touch with a couple of local hospital groups and they've responded back saying that they're looking for masks so i will also be doing masks for hartford healthcare i have to kind of switch gears here because there's no sidewalk in this part of the road but there's nobody out here as I hear a car coming. So, walking in the grass. You know, there were no cars this whole walk until I pulled this camera out. None at all. Hopefully I'm far enough away from the motorbike that you can hear me. I'm at another stretch with sidewalk. Um, dude, cool it. Focusing on the masks for the nursing home first because that was the first I'd heard that anywhere local was taking them. And then I'll be sewing those kind of flat pleated surgical masks for a few locations under Hartford Healthcare. Cause uh, making masks feels like a tangible thing that I can do to help right now, you know, other than stay at home and everything. Um, I don't remember if I said on the last vlog, uh, but I, I am lucky enough that I can work from home uh, with my job, so I don't have huge tons of time to make masks, but with not commuting, I do have some time. And yeah, it just, sorry. I'm not used to vlogging, now my shoulder is sore. <laughs> it feels like something tangible I can do which is kind of helping the general, you know, societal anxiety that we're all feeling right now. Um, so, um, if this is a thing that you can do to help, I would suggest uh, reaching out to local facilities near you, uh, nursing homes, um, other medical groups, I've seen um, veterinary clinics looking for them. You know, if you are close with your local grocery chain or your post office or an essential service, ask them if they need some. Um, Cause I don't know about you, but I have a ton of cotton fabric, a ton. <laughs> I mean, I might burn myself out on them, but you know, do what you can where you can. And I gotta put this phone now phone down now because there is no sidewalk here. <laughs> See? No. Nowhere to walk. You may be able to hear my parents talking in the background. Just ignore it. Um, today is Thursday, April 2nd, 
and I was just laid off from my job. So you'll probably see a lot more filmage happening uh, on these vlogs for a while because I don't know what's happening. And uh, first thing I'm gonna do is the thing that I always do when I'm unexpectedly stressed is uh, reorganize things because that's how you organize everything else in your life by organizing the same two rooms over and over again. Hello, I have no idea what I've filmed up to this point. Um, just checking in. Um, it is Friday, April 10th. Um, and yeah, I didn't really have anything to say there. Um, I've been making masks and I don't think I've filmed very much of it because so many of us are making masks. Y'all kind of know what making masks uh, looks like at this point. Um, although I have overdone it, as is my usual style, and now my um, shoulder up by the shoulder blade is very unhappy with me, so I have to slow it down. Uh, I am planning on finishing the masks I have maybe taking a break for a short project because um, I have to rest the shoulder. 
Um, because we don't want to deal with things that might require physical therapy in this time of pandemic. We don't, we don't want that. No. But what I can talk more about, uh, which I was working on the other day while I was resting my shoulder, is my Hogwarts founder 10th century Salazar Slytherin costume. So, the plan. Uh, I've collated all my notes into this sketchbook because I want heavy duty paper to go in my file of samples and things. So um, I've got inspiration from uh, a particular fan fiction uh, of a linear circle by Flamethrower, um, which was one of the inspirations that was pinging in my brain. I have my list of eh, most of my sources. A lot of it was just Googling and reading a lot of things. Um, and then my plans for the items of clothing. So I did a couple of sketches. This guy is the first sketch. I um, sketched them in the style of the illustrations done by monks at the time because I haven't drawn a human figure in a decade. So the wind is noisy. So this is basically my plan for this year, which is the undergarments. Um, obviously a shirt slash under tunic um, done with rectangles and triangles, uh, hand sewn. I will be making mine out of hemp because I have that fabric here. <laughs> I don't have white linen um, and I've read in one or two places that hemp was also a common um, fabric to be used and I have it so might as well use it and I will probably be referencing um, Morgan Donner's um, sort of tunic tutorial that she has here on YouTube. Um, and then also a set of berets. Now there's not a ton of mention of basically medieval undershorts, um, but for my own sake wearing <laughs> this costume, undershorts, um, which again is very simple construction. Uh, two rectangles for the legs and like a gusset that will... Uh, I've seen two different constructions from um, SCA blogs. Um, so that's the one that I feel will be uh, most comfortable for me. So I'll be making those out of the same hemp fabric and I'm going to be uh, finger loop braiding probably. Um, the drawstring and ties for this garment. And then the main clothes, which I've also done in the uh, medieval style, because that was really fun to draw, uh, is primarily what I'm going to be sampling for uh, this year. Um, main garment is the tunic, which I'm going to hand weave the fabric for. So I have to sample um, the size of the heddle I'm going to use and which yarns I'm going to use. I have a fingering weight BFL, a lace weight BFL, and I also have a lace weight it might be linen, it might be cotton, I'm not sure, but it's already in the green that I want. Um, so I'm going to test those three as warps and I'm going to test the um, the fingering weight and the lace weight BFL for the weft because I do want at least 50% of this garment to be out of wool because that would have been the common, um, especially just regular garment um, fabric. Um, so that's going to be in green. I'm also going to be doing um, tablet weaving for the trim at the neck and at the end of the skirt. Um, I have to do the sampling for that. Um, both the size of the yarns and the patterns that I want to do. 
Uh, I have a big list of patterns that I need to also collate into this um, notebook for the time being. Um, I'm also going to be doing, there's some debate over what uh, the actual lines in medieval drawings means on these sleeves. There's a bunch of drawings where there's just a bunch of parallel lines on the sleeves with a lot of speculation as to what that meant uh, <laughs> because they are drawings and there's not a ton of surviving um, like 8th, 9th, 10th century garments. So what I'm going to do for this is basically do parallel bands of a thin tablet woven almost like a ribbon and at a it's going to be sewn onto the sleeve, but the seam in that sleeve is going to be left open. And at one side, there's going to be a loop in the band, and on the other, there's going to be a fabric button. Um, because I know myself, I need to be able to roll up my sleeves. <laughs> um, and since this is going to be a plain weave or a tabby weave, it's not terribly stretchy. It's not a fabric that is easily pushed up to the elbows, um, so I'm going to have the forearms of my sleeves be able to be opened so that I can roll them up, um, just because if I am going to be wearing it, say, at a renaissance fair or at an all-day event, probably two hours into it, I will be rolling up those sleeves. Um, I will probably do a similar fastening um, in the under tunic, uh, maybe just with a quick set of ties at the wrist, and then it'll just be kind of open, like, to here. I haven't decided on the belt yet. That will either be a leather belt that I already own or a tablet-woven uh, fabric belt, but I need to play around with sampling for the tablet weaving uh, before I make any decisions on that. Um, there will be hose. Uh, in this gray, I am going a little bit controversial with this. Uh, I'm going to be knitting the hose. Now, technically, we do not have any samples of knitted garments in Europe uh, for another couple of centuries, uh, but there are samples of knitting uh, from the Middle East. I believe it was as old as the 8th century. This period of time that I'm looking at, 990 AD, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain and Portugal, uh, was primarily under Muslim rule. A lot of Spain was, uh, I don't remember the exact terminologies, but it was uh, under the rule of the Caliphate. And uh, so a significant number of Muslim people from North Africa had emigrated to uh, particularly southern Spain, which you can see, still see like today, a lot of southern Spain, the road signs are in, I believe it's Arabic, but don't quote me on that. Um, it's it's certainly a, a Middle Eastern originated script uh, on the road signs. I'm pulling a little bit of inspiration, again, like I said, from A Volinear Circle by Flamethrower, uh, and she does a lot of kind of origin story of the four founders, because Salazar is not an English name. It was more likely to be a Spanish name. Her Salazar Slytherin comes from sort of northwestern Spain, and so... I'm extrapolating a bit that knitting was probably around a bit uh, in Spain at the time, therefore I will be knitting my hose instead of sewing hose on the bias. Because that's a skill that I have, and I kind of just really want to knit some hose. So I have Rambouillet naturally dyed with cochineal in a gray, um, so I'm going to be knitting my hose. Um, the heel construction will probably not be historically accurate, but I am not going to use purling stitches, uh, which wasn't really in any of the extant garments 
or samples of knitting from around that time. It kind of went stuck in a color work purling later from what they've been able to recover. Um, so knitting the hose, uh, I will also be tablet weaving the garters. Um, they will not hopefully not be visible in the actual garment, but I did make them visible here for my own reference. Um, and then the shoes slash boots. I have not decided what I'm doing with these yet. I think it'll depend on how the rest of this project shakes out and my future employment situation. Uh, so my options are either to buy kind of the historically accurate sort of ankle high with long leather ties that crisscross up the leg, make the period accurate shoes that are short with the crisscross ties, or go for my fancy knee-high renaissance fair boots that I already own and have invested in. Um, there is some wiggle room with Salazar Slytherin because he is a wizard. And then I did start a list of accessories. Most uh, folks of the 10th century also wore sort of basic cloaks over their clothing, especially outside. Uh, I'm going to be basically hemming a piece of wool fabric um, in a big rectangle to drape as a cloak and pin with a, a penannular pin because um, I've seen some on Etsy that are snake shaped and I really like them. So uh, I, the plan is to do some embroidery around the edges of this cloak rectangle. Um, I have not finalized anything for that yet but it's uh, at some point I will be doing some sampling for that, but that's not a huge priority this year. Um, and then trying to find some items, uh, jewelry, uh, people, especially rich and prestigious people, like, say, the founding member of the premier <laughs> uh, magic school in the British Isles, uh, would wear jewelry you would show your wealth so rings are a definite thing that i need to be on the lookout for possibly those kind of open bracelets it's not a huge priority but something i'm going to be keeping an eye out for um and then of course um the wand uh if all goes well i will be hand carving my wand I will also probably be making some kind of a wand holster. I have a knife to wear on the belt because everybody would have carried a knife at that point. So those are my plans as of right now. Um, like I said, more towards the beginning of the year, I want to have the sort of undergarments completed and um, do my sampling for all of the finicky bits, because uh, I probably have a dozen tablet weaving patterns that I want to try to see how they look. I need to figure out what I'm doing for the actual fabric for the tunic. Because I will be dyeing the yarn myself, the yarn I have is undyed. I have yarn dyes. Uh, I will not be doing naturally dyeing. I could, but it would take me forever to get the right shade of green because I know myself. So I'm going acid dyes for for this particular project, but maybe I will do a naturally dyed tunic in the future just as a thing to do. In order to do most of my sampling, I do need to finish the weaving project that's currently on the loom, uh, which is fine. That gives me some time to um, wind up my yarns and kind of start picking out scraps to play with tablet weaving. Uh, what else has been going on in the craft room? I could give you an update on the machine knit uh, yoke sweater. I have shown some video footage, but not a ton. So the pieces I have finished are uh, the back piece up to the yoke and the two front pieces up to the yoke, 
which are just black. So that's nothing super exciting. Uh, I believe this cardigan is going to be a little more close fitting than what I normally gravitate towards, but um, I also haven't blocked these pieces yet. I don't think I'm going to block this until it's completely done. If it ends up being too small, oh well. But I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I've started the first sleeve. I'm doing contrasting cuffs on the sleeves uh, because my... It's hard to tell right now because so many of the balls are just small bits of black. Um, but it's looking like it's starting to run low. So I'm doing the cuffs in the copper penny colorway. The ribbing does take me a while to do because I drop the whole column down and then ladder it back up. And it is an awkward... Uh, position to do. Um, but that's gonna do it for this check-in. I will talk to you again later. So I don't know if it was clear in the video before, but this is the finished knitting portion of this round yoked cardigan um, on the knitting machine. You can see I have each of the five pieces. There are two fronts on either side, a sleeve, and then the back. And basically to do the yoke, it's a series of hanging pieces, doing some knitting, scrapping it off, and then rehanging pieces with decreases. Each one of these orange things is scrap yarn, where I scrapped it off um, and then rehung it on the machine to continue knitting. Now if I've done this right, um, we've got this little piece here. When I unravel it, then it should be clean. I should have picked up all of the stitches. Hopefully there are no dropped stitches. There is a bit of, <laughs> by a bit, I mean a lot of seaming to do afterwards because there are these gaps like here, like this was one piece that was hung on a knit and this was one piece that was hung a knit. And there's an extra stitch on each of these to account for a seam in this 
area. Um, but yeah, it wasn't that difficult to do. Granted, I have made several pieced sweaters by machine before. If this had a pattern on it, it would be a lot more difficult um, to get that lined up, uh, which is why I didn't try a pattern on this. So I'm going to start unraveling my scrap yarns, make sure that I picked up, in fact, all of the stitches, and fix anywhere where I may have dropped a stitch, uh, and see what that looks like. Alright, I've removed all of the waste yarn. You can see where the, the decreases and the pickups are. Um, luckily, you were going to be able to see those lines anyway because of the nature of the sweater, so I didn't um, alternate skeins of this hand-dyed yarn or anything. So I'm going to block this uh, sweater creature and um, then start seaming it up. It's Saturday, April 20 whatever, 25th, maybe, something. And I can't remember if I've talked about the garden aloud on the podcast before, at least for this year. Sorry, I sound great. Allergy season is starting up. Those five pots in this front tire have matter root in them. Now I'm 100% sure that... Five of my matter roots have survived the winter. One of those, I don't remember which one, and I'm not going to go look right now because I'm tired. Uh, it wasn't showing little leaves a couple of weeks ago. Now it has been cold and raining and or snowing for the past like week and a half. So hopefully they've survived. That wheelbarrow had dahlias in it last year. It's going to have dahlias in it again because they really liked growing out of that wheelbarrow. 
I'm hoping to have enough dahlia flowers to be able to dye with this year. A lot of my dahlias came up white last year, and you can't dye anything with white flowers. And I've also got some plants to go in that wood thing back there. I do have to fill that up with more dirt. Uh, but over a nice, healthy crust of leaves, that'll be really good for the plants. Now, there's not much action going on in the garden right now. Um, I do have a dandelion in a pot, uh, which may just stay there. And I don't remember my exact layout. I'll share it at some point, probably when I start planting, because then it'll be 100% <laughs> nailed down. But um, tomatoes are going to go in these two spots with cages. I had tomatoes in that back one last year, and they didn't do too well. I think it was too shady. I was operating under uh, garden conditions from almost 20 years ago. That tree has gotten taller since then, so the shade is a little different, uh, but you live and learn. And tomatoes do really well for us, and I'm gonna plant marigolds around the tomatoes again, which is what I did last year, and both of them really liked that a lot. I don't remember what I'm putting there, but I do have some hollyhocks that are starting to come up. Um, I don't know if those are in a good place, so they might not survive, but they survived the winter, so I don't know. These are the woads that I planted last year. I don't think they died over the winter. I don't think I got cold enough for them to die. Um, they're much bigger this year, which I believe is what I read about them, um, that if they make it, they get bigger. So I'm just going to let them do their thing. And then if I feel like it, I'll try wood dying again in the fall. But it was a lot of work for a lot of nothing last year. I don't know. I'll decide. I'll see what they're looking like through the summer. Because we also have a lot of bugs that like to eat woad. So we'll see if they survive. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I added dirt to that bed. And I added dirt to that bed. Because they were real low. There was like four inches between the top of the dirt and the top of the bed. Just because of time since <laughs> my parents last used the garden. Um, so I did that a couple of weeks ago, and that dirt is, you know, it's settled down a little bit because there was air in the bags of dirt. But this bed, this bed, this, and this area here are all going to get the same treatment. That rhubarb is fine where it is, but where my squash were last year and this bed and this bed is where the thorny raspberry infestation of death was. When I yanked all of that up December 2018, it basically destabilized this whole area. Um, the path is stable because I put down cardboard and mulch on top of it, so there's at least surface tension. There was something for the water to go into, um, but because of the raspberries and all that kind of stuff, there wasn't a lot of leaf debris to break down into the soil. There wasn't... I don't know how to phrase this. It's almost like wet cake. Like if you take a chunk of birthday cake and you just squish it and it holds its shape, that's what that dirt is like. So what I've done with this bed is we have behind that horrible bush. We have an old sandbox from when we were little kids. My dad built a sandbox. And at some point, he was aiming to turn it, turn it into an herb garden, so he had rototilled a whole bunch of soil into there. So it's a nice soil-sand mixture. So I went and I dug a hole and uh, brought some sand dirt over here. Tried to mix it up with... Um, the dirt that was already there, just by hand. I didn't bring the rototiller. I just don't want to mess with that. And um, hopefully, seeds will be able to take better in these areas, because judging by how that sandbox is overgrown, uh, stuff likes that combination. And also, I want to turn that little area into a proper bed instead of just a couple of mounds of dirt. But that's a lot of work, and it's hot. And I don't know where the dog went, so I'm going to go find her and deal with the rest of this another time.
for any natural dye uh, experimenters out there, I have discovered that I don't know if it's just because I get the cheap stuff or what, but my washi tape is no longer holding my samples in place. So I'm going back through and stapling them because I know they won't go anywhere unless I pull at them with a lot of force. So uh, if you're putting together a similar dye experiment book, uh, the washi tape may look real cool, but apparently it's not sticking long enough to keep my samples uh, in. So I'm going to go through and staple all these guys. Now the good thing about washi tape is you can actually, if they're still kind of in the right place, you can staple through the washi tape and just peel it right off. But uh, pro tip for me, I've only been natural dyeing for a year and some change, and um, yeah, my sample's are already coming out of this book. Uh, hello, this is Adrian, just kind of doing a bit of a roundup at the end of this vlog style thing for April. I'm probably going to do it again for May. Just a heads up, the crafting that I've traditionally done on this channel is likely uh, not going to be featured very heavily uh, in the next month uh, because my shoulder... My shoulder. Um... Now, I've been having on and off shoulder pain, um, like around the shoulder blade, but it's in one of those spots where I can't tell if it's a repetitive stress injury or if it's just tension that will not release, uh, because that is an area of my back where I do carry tension, so I don't know, but uh, hand sewing makes it real bad, knitting doesn't help it, uh, Spinning doesn't help, um, crochet wouldn't help, obviously, and uh, weaving doesn't always make it happy either. Um, sometimes I can go at the sewing machine for a little bit, but after 20 to 30 minutes, it's not happy about that, so, and it does not like the height of my iron. So, that table and where I'm ironing, it doesn't like it. <laughs> so, I'm just going to basically slow all the way down on those crafts and let this shoulder deal with itself um, for the time being. Uh, my notes completely went away. So as it is, I don't really have any updates for knitting and crocheting to show you in this portion of the video. Uh, really just like small amounts of knitting or crocheting that I've done uh, sporadically. There's no visible progress on anything. Um, I did manage to do some tablet weaving samples um, in between this shoulder thing going on. These are some of the samples for my 990 AD Salazar Slytherin costume, um, so I'm just gonna go through these samples with you real quick. Um, if you haven't seen the previous episode, where I, or do I talk about it in this episode? I have no idea what's going into this video. So the first um, tablet weaving sample I decided to do was from a pattern draft from thelumibin.com. Uh, link will be in the show notes over at freakishlemon.com or freakishlemonpodcast.com links to things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. Um, so what I did was I have this index card, I wrote down the pattern draft, and then I attached my samples. Now this, this, uh, this one is supposed to be like a three-stranded braid pattern, but it did not work for me. Neither of these, let's see if it'll focus, neither of these samples really gets this bit right. 
Now this does look a little weird because I did have a different color yarn in here instead of the pink that I was using. Pretty sure I ran out of the uh, mini skein I was using. But none of these lines match up in the middle. I don't know. I don't know if it's because there's an error in the draft or if I just didn't do it right twice. <laughs> but um, this pattern is pretty much out of the running for being of any use to me. These other ones are samples from the book Card Weaving by Candace Crockett, um, which is a book that I bought to learn how to do card weaving. So I'm just going through the book and doing a bunch of samples of the example drafts that are in there. The first one I did is this ram's horn pattern. Um, and this is what it should look like. And um, I'm very pleased with this. This was actually easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, the piece was easy to keep even. I was able to basically memorize the pattern. I was able to just repeat it on my own by the end there. And this is in the running um, for the decorative trim around the collar. Uh, of the tunic and possibly around the skirt of the tunic, but I'm not sure. I've got some other things I want to look out for, but I think for the the tunic collar, um, this is uh, a fairly popular pattern um, around that time, I believe. Um, so definitely one that I would like to do more of which helps if you're putting it in a project. Um, and then I tried this pattern. This is, let's see if we can focus. This one didn't come out, ignore my face, camera. There we go. So this is a type of pattern where not every hole in the card is threaded and it's supposed to play with it's not going to focus on it now. It's supposed to play with um, warp threads that are there and the empty spaces so that you can see the weft thread. I don't think I did this very well. Um, it looks better down at the bottom here. It's not even though. And then I think I pulled it too tight all the way up. Now, my thought for this is that I could potentially use this for hose garters. Uh oh, I dropped some. I don't have a table or anything. Everything's just balanced on my lap. Which is not the greatest way to do things when you're lazily podcasting. Anyway, thought I might use this for hose garters, um, but I need to do another sample, I think, and try to mitigate how tight this is being pulled to see if, if it's something that I want to do. And then this one went a little weird. Um, there's a page in Candace Crockett's book with um, a draft. It's like four narrow patterns together. So I decided to draft a version of it where there was the one like chevron, are you gonna focus? There's the one chevron in the middle and then slanting lines uh, mirroring it, which uh, the sample came out correct, but the, the right side was this and not the pattern I was going for. So I don't know why that happened. Um, if you're a card weaver and you can tell me why that happened, I would appreciate hearing from you. My hypothesis is that if I thread this the other way than what I've written, this will show up on the right side. Because uh, I'd rather not weave a long piece if I can't see what the right side looks like. So I'm going to do another sample of this and try threading um, threading the cards in the opposite direction. Um, 
this, I really do like how this turns out. This is definitely a contender for the decorative trim around the skirt of the tunic, or if I add another panel on each side as a belt, um, which I thought about maybe doing. Um, but I, I need to play around with this one a little bit more to get myself totally comfortable. But, um, but yeah, once I got it going, the pattern was easy. It was just, I don't know why it was upside down. Um, and then the last one I did was just this simple um, alternate threading uh, method where it's it's just how you're threading the cards that creates the pattern, which makes a really nice simple band. The only, like it looks, it's got the same sort of chevrons as like a knitted piece, which I think looks cool. And then there's, is it visible? It's more visible here. Um, there's this like decorative line when you change direction of the cards, um, which I like. So that's also in the running to um, be a belt, or if that, um, if nothing else works, I'll use this for the hose garters and just make it a narrower band um, to make it easier to tie around my leg. Uh, I have, I think, two other patterns that I want to sample for uh, when my shoulder feels up to it. Um, right now I'm just basically cutting my, le my lengths of sample yarns uh, to get those ready to go. That's really the only crafting things I have to talk about. I'll have shown you plenty of what's been going on. Um, so mostly what I have to talk about is other stuff because that's mostly what we're doing right now. Uh, you know, sheltering in place or working from home or laid off or just trying to keep your head on straight if you do have to leave the house to go work. Uh, yeah, we're all kind of in other stuff land right now. So, uh, stuff I'm watching, um, watched, uh, Letter to the King, which is a fantasy show on Netflix. I was disappointed by how short it was. It was a delight to watch, and it's, it's a delightful, straightforward fantasy quest story, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I finished watching uh, Luna Nera, which is an Italian show about witches on Netflix. I don't recall when the show is supposedly set, but it's like alternate fantasy history with witches in Italy. Um, I have been watching RQ Streams, which is the twitch.tv channel for Rusty Quill, um, that podcast company that I keep obsessing over their podcasts about, um, their community manager, Anil, and their video production guy, Mike, um, do basically introductory looks at different kinds of video games, um, which is really cool. They sometimes visit old games that, that are nostalgic, uh, to show a certain type of game, like a city builder or, um, um, or like time management games, uh, or they'll do newer titles that neither of them have played. Um, right now they're kind of alternating who's streaming what, and then sometimes they do just streams where they chat, or uh, there's a delightful one of Anil quizzing Mike on geography. It's an extremely hard geography quiz, and very thorough. It was really fun to watch that that because their dynamic was hilarious. Um, and that was back when they could stream in the same room. Uh, so definitely recommend that Twitch channel, especially if you're interested in video games but don't know where to start. I also just started watching a show on Amazon Prime 
called Detective Anna. It's a Russian show set in the late 19th century about a young woman who can see ghosts and solves mysteries. Um, I'm only a few episodes in, but I'm enjoying it so far. Uh, stuff I'm listening to. I started listening to I Am In Askew, which is a horror fiction podcast. Um, it comes up in lists alongside the Magnus Archives, uh, and I love the Magnus Archives, so I figured I'd give this one a shot. Um, it's slow listening for me just because... This particular podcast is one that I like, like, in the middle of a bunch of other podcasts. Like, two lighthearted things, My Favorite Murder, I Am in a Skew, two more lighthearted things, Lord of the Rings podcast. Like, it's great in a lineup of podcasts, but I don't gravitate towards it, listening to it on its own. But that might change, I'm only, um... I don't know how far I am in, but not terribly far. <laughs> and then uh, stuff I'm playing, because my brain's gone into summer vacation mode, and therefore it is time to play video games. So I've got a bunch of video games here that I've been playing, and they're kind of all over the place, as I will explain. So first thing I started playing seriously, other than, you know, just fun little games on my phone, was Firewatch. It is a story game, so, hey, what are you doing? So it's not a shooter, it's not hit people with swords, you are playing through a story. Um, you play a man named Henry who takes a position as a Firewatch person in the forests of Wyoming, uh, and you have to solve a mystery. It is super suspenseful and uh, really fun to play. I bought it on Steam to play it on my PC, found out that my laptop was way too old and way too slow to play it, and then played it on my Mac Mini, which was also not the best, but was manageable. Um, next on my list is Journey, which um, is an exploratory story game. Um, and there's no dialogue, the whole thing is told via visuals and sound, and your character goes on an epic journey, and it's delightful, and, like, has that beautiful orchestral music that just, like, makes you feel all the feelings. It's so good. Um, and, uh, it was free when I bought my PS4. I was in a position where buying a PlayStation 4 was cheaper than trying to be able to play games on my PC or getting a new PC or upgrading anything. So I'm very lucky I was in that position and Journey was free with my PS4. Um, but if you can get a copy of Journey, it's totally worth playing. Uh... Then I played uh, Machinarium, or Machinarium, uh, which is a point-and-click puzzle game featuring quirky, junky robots, uh, and I played that on Android. You can get it on Steam uh, for PC and probably Mac, too. I don't see why not. It's a point-and-click game. And if it's available on Android, it may be available on iOS. Um, I saw Anel play it on the Rusty Quill streaming channel and was like, that is totally my type of game. Um, it is a puzzle game. Some of those puzzles are super hard, but it also has a, a hints thing, a hints um, mechanic, and a way for you to play a little mini game to get a walkthrough of the level that you're in. Um, which was super cool, because if I was real stuck, I could just get on over to the walkthrough, um, just to see what direction I even needed to go in with the puzzle. <laughs> um, and then I just finished Life is Strange. Uh, it's another story game, because I love story games. 
you play a young woman named Max, who's a photographer in her like first year of college. And there's time travel, which is fun. Um, but there's a lot of dark, real life, dark stuff that happens in that game. Uh, so look up content warnings uh, before playing if you're concerned about that. Um, that was an emotional roller coaster, and I played that on my PS4. Um, the first chapter of that game is currently free on the PlayStation Network, but it is totally worth getting if you like playing story games. Um, and then I started Uncharted Drake's Fortune, which is the first Uncharted. Uh, this game, it's an adventure game more in line with what you would imagine for a video game. You control Drake, he goes and shoots bad guys and climbs things and finds treasure. Theoretically. <laughs> Theoretically. We're on our way to treasure, where I am in the game right now, but it also was free on the PlayStation Network. Uh, so I grabbed it. Uh, and that's on my PlayStation 4. Um, I'm also playing on my phone a game called Choo Chill. I think it's how it's pronounced. It's by the people who made Machinarium or Machinarium. Um, it's a point and click puzzle game, but this time with funny monsters. So I'm playing that on uh, my phone, on Android. Uh, that's probably also available on iOS if you're an iPhone user. And then I'm revisiting two games periodically. Um, I'm revisiting uh, Star Wars Dark Forces, um, which is a first-person shooter. It's basically the original Doom reskinned to be Star Wars, and I play with cheats on because that's how I roll. So my dude never dies, and I'm s I still get lost and have no idea what's happening. So I'm not great at video games. I just have a lot of fun playing them when they don't kill me all the time. Um, yeah, I, I bought that through Steam, and I can play that on my PC, because my PC is 10 years old this year. So, yeah, I can play games pre-2005, pre is the realm I'm looking at. Um... And I'm revisiting uh, Fall on London, which is a choose-your-own-adventure, mostly text-based game. There's some illustrations, but none of them really move. Um, it's a dark fantasy alternate history. Uh, you're an escaped convict from, uh, like, underground Newgate prison. There's demons all over the place. Uh, that's a browser game, so... Anybody can play it if you have internet access. Um, and I enjoy picking it up every once in a while. Just play for 10-15 minutes. Um, in between other things. So yeah, video games is what I'm doing right now. To keep myself sane and to not aggravate the shoulder. Um... That's really going to do it for this episode. So, as always, the links to everything are down here on YouTube or around here if you're watching this somewhere else. Show notes are at FreakishLemon.com. You can follow me as FreakishLemon on Instagram and Ravelry. Um, that's really it. Goodbye. <laughs>